All right, let's start. Um, Andy Moore is with us, so you have the, the intro on the site. Um, and Andy plays into my slides because uh, last year, uh, he's a colleague at the Center for Digital Media, and last year as I was thinking about the future of technology, which is really what, what this talk is about, um, we brainstormed where, brain, where, where games were going, and you'll see a bunch of influences, and you'll also see a lot of slides, because I've been working on some of these ideas, in fact, all year. Um, and every year, there's sort of one file that grows massively. Um, and last year, it was the privacy file the privacy surveillance file. And weirdly enough, this year, it, and maybe it's the, it's the new generation of consoles, um, it, it's this file that, that just kept growing. Um, the violence misogyny file is just always huge. So, um, uh, although it's probably grown a bit the last few weeks. Uh, so, this... This talk is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll place it a, a little bit later again, but it's the last talk in the connecting meme of the course, which has largely been about contracts law, but it's, a, it's really about today technology as a connector. Next week, we start the controlling meme, and we'll start with controlling creativity. We'll, in a sense, go back to the beginning of the course. And when we start thinking about controlling technology, a lot of that will end up being about privacy. So you'll see the flow, but it mirrors um, where we were on, on, on creating in a sense. A couple of very quick updates. Uh, badges seem to be working. Initial results are promising. If anybody's got um, reactions, comments, um, please let me know. If something isn't working, let me know. Badges are being upgraded and redesigned by the fine folks at uh, the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology so that they'll look better, uh, and I am still working on a complete post um, as to how all this will work and how it will evolve well beyond this particular iteration of the course, because it's really just an experiment for you guys, but an experiment that's going well. Um, next week is UBC uh, Open Access Week. Um, lots of good talks, lots of good stuff going on. Uh, so if you're interested, and I know what a busy time this is, um, there's lots of lunch talks and things. There's the website. Talked about this at the beginning of the course. Um, have got the go-ahead from the associate dean. We are going to do this this semester. Uh, just going to nail down the date. Um, we're going to set up an alternate room in the law school where those of you who want to try taking part of the class with an oculus on your head and seeing what that looks like and feels like uh, in 3D um, uh, will be able to do so. Um, thanks to Jesse Judre, who's a, a developer in, in the field. He's getting about seven or eight of them. Um, so we'll figure out how to sign up and how to do all of those things. Also, I think Andy will tell you a little bit about 3D immersion. So it's actually, this, it's perfect that this is going to come towards the end of the course and after the talk today. Uh, originally, I was thinking it would be in concert with the talk today, and I, I don't think that would work. That, that's like too much going on at one time um, to really get it. One 
warning, well worth reading this. The, the headline is, um, she got unfairly criticized for this headline. What this is really about is that uh, it appears that 3D headsets uh, create more discomfort in women than in guys. So just be just beware. It doesn't seem dangerous. Doesn't seem to to really be a problem. But uh, Dana Boyd is is awesome. Um, there's the link uh, to her piece. Uh, it sort of turned into her being attacked for using the word sexist when a piece of machinery can't be sexist. That's beside the point, or at least beside the point that I want anyone to focus on, and that is that there's a small um, health issue, so whether you decide you want to do this or not. And also, guys can have the same experience. Um, and every time I've tried it, people have said, are you okay, are you okay, for the first couple of minutes. So we'll, we'll and, and I am, but I never get seasick, et cetera, et cetera. So, Andy, is there any... Is there more info on that? All of the VR headsets are very much uh, developer kits. Um, they're just temporary hardware just to get software off the ground. They're not really meant to be worn for anything longer than 15 minutes, and there's no ergonomics in them. So they put all the wrong pressure points on all the wrong bones. There's no padding. Well, there is padding, but there's hardly any padding. It's uncomfortable, and the... Uh, I'm going to talk later on about kind of the ethics of designing software within a virtual reality environment because it's really easy to create discomfort with software, never mind the hardware feeling. Like it's uh, in a sense of two to five seconds, I can induce a sense of nausea in anyone. So it's, it's not hard. And, and it's really gonna, easy to accidentally about, do it. Yeah. And, and we're going to talk about this today. And if my, if my talks don't induce enough nausea, then, you know, <laughs> you might really want to stay away from this. But again, there's not going to be any rules. It's not going to be like if you sign up for this, you have to force yourself to wear it. For, you know, the, the rule is if you're the least bit uncomfortable, get the heck out of there. It doesn't, it's, all, it's all quite all right. Um, so here we are in the course, last piece on connecting and technology connects. So follow-ups. I um, have to throw this in because we talked about sort of the, the tattoo um, uh, picture within picture issue. I, I, I love this one. Um, Rod Stewart is being sued over the rights to an image of his own head. And what it was is that a photographer who owns the copyright took a photo of the back of Rod Stewart's head. It became rather a famous photo. Rod Stewart replicated, didn't use that photo, but used a similar photo in, uh, in his campaign, and he's being sued by the original photographer. So, again, you get, we're getting into this sort of picture within picture, endless zone, and it's just one to think about as you think about uh, tattoos. Um, many of you will want to go here, and here's the, the link, but uh, the Activision um, Destiny contract that was referred to last week uh, is all online. Here's the link to it. I actually found it myself. It's easy to find. Um, 27 pages. Uh, anybody who's really interested in the area, you want to read this contract. Um, another follow-up. We've been talking about consumer protection. This just came out um, literally this morning. Um, those of you who are a bit more hardcore will know that the Battlefield 4 launch from EA was just a complete disaster, um, mostly because of the, on, the online wasn't working, et cetera, et cetera. And they ended up being sued, um, and court just said this wasn't securities fraud, it was puffery. I, I haven't been able to fully analyze it or get my hands on the decision. It's there, the link is there, uh, came out 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, so possibly something we'll talk about more by the end of the course, depending on whether it's interesting or not. 
Um, now, bunch of, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like this course is supported by unseen forces because there's, it seems to always be news that's relevant to the stuff we're talking about. Um, I don't know if anybody has followed uh, the whisper stuff, um, but this is all about what whisper is tracking and what it's not, what its end user license agreement says what, and what it allows for and what it doesn't. And there's a lot of back and forth with the Guardian and Whisper, um, and it's well worth, uh, and, and it's all in News of the Week, which I actually got up first thing this morning for a change, and uh, you can follow kind of where we're at on this, um, and it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, this is even more interesting because it covers both the EULA stuff and the post-structuralism stuff. Um, and it's, I call it short journal article. Um, and it basically says that gamers should, are not consumers. That they're in fact, that the better model is that of being citizens. Um, I don't know if that's the right word. I might use the word participants. Um, and uh, tends to veer a little bit towards the solution being the constitutionalization of virtual worlds, which um, kind of is an old saw, uh, and I, I, it doesn't feel terribly realistic to me, the notion of virtual worlds as a separate country. Um, but I don't know that it's unrealistic to think that there should be a separate legal regime that, uh, that, that uh, applies in an international law sense. I mean, I think there is a realistic way of doing this. We've already seen it done with copyright and, and, uh, uh, and, and how copyright was essentially promulgated as international law. So th there, are, there are real solutions. Uh, this gets at some of the issues, but it also tends to reinforce the post-structuralism argument for exactly the same reason. Um, uh, the, the fact that we're looking at um, not a uniform class of consumers uh, with one definition, but multifaceted users slash citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, well worth reading. Um, and then just a bunch of, of uh, additional articles um, uh, that, uh, some of which mentioned last week, but again, if you're interested in, in EULAs and contracts from a paper perspective, and I know some of you are, I want to make sure that it's there. Uh, so... There's one slide I felt I too blithely skipped over last week, and it's on how come the law is accepting something that we all know is nonsense. We all know that none of us read end user license agreements. We know that they're all different. Um, and why is it? the judges think this is okay. Anybody have any guesses from first year contract? Yeah, go for it. Freedom of contract, yes, but can you take me a little deeper? Right, but I know I'm not, but we all know, and the judges will acknowledge that no one's reading this stuff. So you don't know what you're agreeing to. So how come they're still upholding it? Go ahead, you're first. You're very close. I, I, I'll, I'll recast it slightly in in kind of old-fashioned legal terms, but I think you're, you're 
Very close. Yeah, it reminds me of like the OS in the case of like a, like a parking lot that turns in the back. Yeah. Bingo. Why do you say you make an action? What is is what is the operating system that you have to do the action correctly? So the common law explains itself. Um, I actually went back last year to my old uh, textbooks from McGill Law in seventy six <laughs> to in nineteen seventy six to figure this out. And uh, that's why Cheshire and Five Foot Ninth Edition, 1976. You guys probably never even heard of Cheshire and Five Foot. I don't know if they're still producing, if there's still a, a text on contract law, but uh, by that name, Con common law is concerned not with the presence of an inward and mental assent, but with its outward and visible signs. So efficiency and business efficiency is a big part of it. So what we care about, in the, and there's been, there are lots of cases in the history of contracts about where this should go, and where it finally settled long before we had end user license agreements, and long before we had digital technology, was this notion that we're, in a sense, we're going to drive ourselves crazy unless we accept outward formality. And... That's, that's really biting us at this point. And how that gets reconciled and whether some new Lord Denning emerges who sees through all of this and figures out the right road forward remains to be seen. But right now we have a lot of cognitive dissonance between um, what we all know we're really doing with these contracts and what the law concludes on these contracts, which, which will also uh, impact uh, some of the things we're talking about. Um, more on, on structuralism, this is sort of a wonderful post. Uh, how's the Stanley Parable going for everyone? I have started it. I have installed it. Um, uh, well, I'll show you one thing. Uh, it has, you know, remember this is a little game and it's uh, sold over a million in a year. It is a very good game. So um, if, if you can, at least start playing the demo. So... Well, yeah, there was a, the demo of the Stanley Parable is sort of a different thing. Well, it, it does retain the demo, but the Stanley Parable does not change. But I think it's worth playing the demo like even if you've already... Oh, really? Because I'm into the game. I, I... If, if you, well, even if you're done with the game, pick up the demo. It's, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a really good hint. Um, I, I, it will, it's entertaining, and it, it, it will sort of alter uh, your mind. This is sort of my, my favorite TV show when I was 10 years old. I don't expect you guys to, to know <laughs> what it really is. Um, but we're... We're looking at the future of technology and we're looking at it through the lens of today because that's all we've got. But when we do that, we start thinking about how does law and tech interact and is there a pattern there and how do we understand it? And that's, that's going to form uh, a part of this. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what, what a holodeck is. I'm not sure I've seen a holodeck in the recent Star Trek movies. It tends to be from the old series. So that's, uh, uh, that, that's a holodeck, I think, from Next Generation. Uh, and this is um, what Microsoft has done and got working, and that's basically turning your entire living room into one giant surround screen. And uh, they have a patent on this, uh, and th they're definitely going holodeck. Um, where we're going to go today, I hope, is quite a bit further than holodecks. Um, holodecks is not really new technology. 
Um, this is a really interesting piece that comes out every year uh, from Gartner, and it is um, kind of where we are in technology, and it, it, it graphs innovation from trigger to peak of inflated expectations. So the trigger is kind of the latest, greatest thing. So down here in terms of latest, this is the 2014 one. You can find them going back, I think, all the way to 2008. Um, uh, so bioacoustic sensing, no idea what that is, is kind of the latest thing. And it's starting to ramp up in terms of expectations. At the very top of expectations is the Internet of Things. Um, and then we go through something called the trough of disillusionment, um, which is, yeah, yeah, it works. It really does nothing. It's not really particularly useful. Kind of getting into the trough of disillusionment is cloud computing and coming, just starting to ramp up out of the trough of disillusionment is virtual reality. The Oculus, like I said, just starting. And then we go into slope of enlightenment, which is how, how do we really use it? How can we use it? And we're, we're past being cynical about it. We're past being, and we're way past being excited about it. And now we're starting to use it. So where are we in slope of enlightenment? Enterprise 3D printing. Right? Enterprise 3D printing was once here. And it's now, okay, it's a usable thing, usable for some things, not going to change the world in other things. Let's just get on with it. Um, and then plateau of productivity, it's actually working. Speech recognition. It's actually working. I now can dictate things. If I'm reading out of a book and I want to put it on a slide, it's actually working. It's, it's, it's remarkable. So now we get to how do you relate memes of justice and technology, which is what I alluded to. And the question essentially becomes, why is the law so slow? Why does it respond so slowly to tech change? Can't we make it faster? And there's lots of evidence around the frustrations here. You know, lots of lawsuits, tech content wars, you know, articles in the MIT Technology Review, law and ethics can't pay, keep pace with technology. Um, when does, this is an article from The Atlantic, when does technology change enough that the law should too? You know, it's a very common theme. Um, and, you know, I've, I've cited this to you before, but, you know, statements from Crown Counsel, such as stealing is stealing whether you use a computer command or a crowbar, and whether you take documents, data, or dollars, it is equally harmful to the victim whether you sell what you have stolen or give it away. No, it's not. You know, it's one of the most ridiculous statements ever for such a narrow paradigm. But... It represents the law not being able to catch up to what's really going on. And if you want to know more about the Aaron Schwartz case, uh, if, uh, if you're curious about it, this is, I think, probably the best article on it. Oh. Huh. Let me just see what's... All right, I guess there's no slide there. So we're disappointed by the disconnect. Should we be disappointed by it? Is it the effect of an inevitable cause? And perhaps a really simple cause that we need to reflect on. Before we get to what the answer might be, Let's look backwards. You know, those who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it. And so I want to tell you a little bit about history. Um, 
and it has to do with something called the 507 patent. For those of you who are car aficionados, that's a BMW 507. Um, and the case is called Magnavox and Mattel. And it's really seminal. And in terms of what we're talking about, is a very useful signpost of what can go wrong in legal analysis when applied to technology. So what did Magnavox had? Magnavox had Pong, essentially. That's what they had. And they had an apparatus that would generate this game on screen, on a television screen. Please underline that in your mind, on a television screen on those old-fashioned, big, you know, when you were born or before you were born, televisions weren't little flat screen, two-inch things. They were these massive devices that, you know, could weigh 80 pounds and had these huge tubes in them. And, and that's what the Magnavox played on. Whoop. Now you gotta go back. In 1962, a game called Space War was released on a mainframe computer at MIT. Space War, I don't know, does Space War have anything to do with rockets, 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 Andy? Because, you know, in a way, it was, it's, it was the prototypical. It was afterwards. Sorry? Was, I, I saw it afterwards, but it was interesting to see. It must have been interesting yeah. to see. So I'll let you address it, but sure. it was the first of the space shooter genre. And, and Andy's latest game is a fabulous game called Rockets, 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 available on Steam. Um, and you can see the lineage. But the important piece here is that Space War, which is not actually, but is essentially acknowledged as the first video game, was on a computer, a big computer, because there was no other kind of computer in 1962. I mean, I'm quite sure that the DEC PDP-1 mainframe had less computing power than any of our iPhones can virtually guarantee that. But now, the 507 patent comes from a different place. It came from a company called Sanders Associates who entered into a license for this technology with Magnavox. And the patent was about how to put a game on a television set. Space War was a game put on a computer screen. Hold that divergence. Is that, is that a distinction without a difference or is that terribly important? You know from today's perspective how that feels and that's obviously the moral of the story but let's, uh, let's let this unfold. So Magnavox releases the Odyssey, which was an analog, was an analog box in its first iteration in 1972. In 1975, Atari introduces Pong in a home console format. They had it in a, in a big box that you could play um, in an arcade, but in, in home console format. And two things happen in 1976. General Instruments introduces a TV game microprocessor. So they're, they're not building a device yet. They're just, they've just created a chip. So they've gone from analog to digital. 
and Magnavox sues Atari. And Atari caves. This was a seminal moment. Atari settles and licenses, becomes the exclusive licensee of Magnavox. So they continue to, to be in business, but they have license terms and are paying Magnavox um, essentially for the, the Sanders patent, the 507 patent. And then by 1978, Magnavox introduces a microprocessor version so they make the jump from analog to digital. In 1979, Mattel introduces the Intellivision. I am in third year law school. I become obsessed with the Intellivision. Um, I play a lot of Intellivision with, with my friend Peter Hamilton. He becomes the gold medalist. My marks, I'd like to say, suffered hugely. Um, but his didn't suffer at all, so I'm not sure I can really make the claim. Um, in any event, Magnavox sues Mattel. And Magnavox succeeds. So the first thing, here's your PDP, here's the mainframe computer, the PDP-1, that's a picture of it. That's the screen, uh, that's your input device. And the first thing the judge, one of the things the judge says is there's no distinction between analog and digital. So the fact that the PDP-1 was digital from the beginning didn't regard that as a big deal. Whatever it's worth, you know, this is all cheating because we're so many years later. We, you know, you know how the story turned out. Um, I'm okay with that. But... Focus. I love that picture. Um, the court found that there was a difference between computers, games, and TV games. And that, from the present perspective, inarguably, is a meaningless distinction. You know, we think today in terms of screens and inputs. And the cloud has made it all the more so. Now, I think we should be careful to not criticize the judge too much because look at what he was looking at at the time. And it's easy to make this mistake. It is undeniably a mistake. And just technically, so you understand the argument, the argument that Mattel raised was, wait a minute, there was prior art before the 507 patent, and the prior art was space war and getting games on a computer at MIT. Therefore, the 507 patent should be, uh, is meaningless, we're really following space war and creating games. Yes, they happen to be on a television, but what does it matter? Which we now know is correct. But the court found it did matter. So why does that, why could this case possibly matter today? What kind of mistake could we make today that looks like that? So I just want to point out that in the red, you have what you might think of as regulated zones. Zones where the government is actively regulating through statute. That have something to do with gaming. Mobile. And uh, just today, the story may have come out yesterday, but just today I saw a story that definitively predicted that by 2015, next year, there will be more revenues from mobile games than from console games. So 
very, you, you know, undeniably significant in a gaming context, regulated. For some of us, not regulated enough, in fact, on the mobile side. And we know television is regulated also by the CRTC. And consoles thus far aren't, and computers also aren't. And I'm not going to take you into the niceties of CRTC exemption orders. Uh, there's a lot of history of someone's interested in writing a paper on it. Uh, we could really dig in. There's a lot there uh, to dig into if you're interested in possible government regulation of video games. Put the question in the most simple form, which should have you recoiling in horror, uh, is Destiny Broadcasting. You're going to go, it can't be. So let me show you the definition of broadcasting. Means any transmission of programs, no question that there's transmission here because it's multiplayer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, hold, hold on to programs for a minute by means of telecommunication, clearly happening. For reception by the public, clearly happening. By means of a broadcasting receiving apparatus, that's an interesting thing, but when you think of Destiny is now available only on a console, and a console is attached to a television, and there's no question that a television is and historically was a broadcasting receiving apparatus. I see a lot of furrowed brows. This is very good, because <laughs> this is the problem. Um, and program... Well, destiny can't be a program, but program is defined as, any co as a combination of sounds and visual images that are intended to entertain. So now you see the problem. And there is a CRTC exemption order, uh, ISPs don't broadcast, um, but what is destiny? Is it an ISP? Is it something? What is it? So there, there's really rich legal analysis in this if anybody's interested in the paper. So why does it keep happening? Um, if anybody hasn't watched Groundhog Day, please do. Source Code's one of my favorite movies, and About Time's fantastic. And they're all based on time repeating itself. Things keep coming until you get them right. And that's a little bit how the legal system works with technology. You keep repeating yourself till you get it right. Napster doesn't look like such a smart decision today. You know, we were all up in arms about it way back when, and now if you analyze the logic, it's pretty questionable and we've almost moved past it. Nobody even talks, and the courts barely talk about the Napster. So why does this keep happening? I think you have to look at what really goes on here. Law will never be able to catch up with technology because technology defines how we communicate. And therefore, it defines how the law communicates and how we communicate the law. You can't ever catch up. In that, if that's correct, you can't jump the shark here. Without any doubt, technology has changed how we communicate with each other. You know that. You know that as young law students. Well, that also gets to the underlying, that becomes a meme of communication and how we communicate with each other affects all things in society, including law, which is a thing in society. A thing with deep roots, a thing that changes, but that change starts with language and how we communicate affects language. So, Law and justice don't shape communications technologies as much as they are shaped by them. That's what I'm suggesting. And, you know, 
we make the law. Not everybody loves that, but we do make the law. Even some of the more right-wing justices of the Supreme Court of the United States will acknowledge that we make the law, they just want the snapshot to be 1776. And say, well, we're, but we're not going to evolve it from then. You know, I'm hardly the only person who thinks that's nonsense. Um, this is kind of a whole other area of research for me, so I'm not going to get into the huge details, but I'm going to suggest that there, the arrow of time works here. And you know, before we had a concept of justice, it was just straight revenge. Then we got into different memes of justice. And you may or may not agree with my characterizations of the memes of justice. I, I think I'm pretty confident in my memes of technology. And the suggestion is very simple, that each huge change in technology influenced how we looked, look at justice as a concept. And how we look at justice as a concept affects law. Because law comes, you know, law is kind of justice, ethics justice law. It devolves into it. Um, and kind of the one that really jumps out, and there's, if there's acceleration, as there has been in almost all things in, in human existence, but the one that should jump out at you is the printing press. And largely justice getting redefined as rights once the printing press democratized information. And then it starts getting pretty quick down here. Digital, big data, virtual reality. Um, you know, big data, I think, is starting to, 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 to get us to understand that, that boundaries are going to be really important in how we understand justice. Now, a little bit more about that. And then the one that we'll leave as an open question, at least for this slide, is virtual reality. That's the coming thing. So in a virtual reality world, how do you define justice? Um, it also might work the other way to some extent. I, I, I think it's, it's a much smaller effect, but it's an important effect. This is a very recent paper by Dan Burke uh, from U UCAL Irvine uh, called Copyright and the Architecture of Digital Delivery. Um, and... It starts by, in, in essence, saying a version of what I just said. Copyright law is largely a response to new media. And, and even cites um, print, the printing press, among other things, through radio, photocopiers, and digital computers. And but then also says that technology is also a response to the law as it evolves, and cites the Napster case. But actually, if you read the paper, I think cites it in a way that's very supportive, because what it suggests is that judges and lawyers have done workarounds on Napster to continue the evolution. That we see this continuing evolution as the technology defines it. So whether that's the law being defined by the technology or the technology defining the law, it seems to all come out in a certain wash. I'll let you, if you're interested, uh, go into it. I'll just point out that these phases, I, I, I cited Shaw to you earlier in the course, these, I, these phases are not mutually exclusive. They overlap and they, they, they supersede each other, but they don't let, we don't let go God, you guys know this in second and third year law school. We never let go of a legal concept. We hang on to it, recast it, um, and eventually we may let go of something, but very grudgingly. It's just that we supersede it. So um, that's a little bit uh, like 
Shaw's observation on how technologies supersede each other. They don't wipe out the previous technology. Um, so virtual reality, just to, this is just what, what I think. It's a big question mark is that where we're eventually going to be going in terms of thinking of justice is freedom of thought. And that ties in directly to the things I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes. That freedom of thought, which is essential, it's part of law, but it really came out of um, sort of uh, religious freedoms, in fact. People can think what they want. Is in my view, going to reemerge for a whole bunch of reasons uh, that have to do with technology and virtual reality and the like. So this is all evolving complexity, and I'm going to go through pretty quick. But f three years ago, even four years ago, we were talking about the living room war. We were talking about the Xbox being, you know, a um, a Trojan horse into the living room to bring entertainment. I mean, this battle is long over. This is how quickly it, it's happened already. Whether it's the Xbox or the PlayStation 4 or some other kind of box um, or just your computer um, or your Apple TV, we are completely superseding traditional, certainly over-the-air television, which barely exists, um, and cable, which is getting superseded in a variety of ways. So the living room war, I don't want to say it's over, because again, we're talking about superseding, but we're in the, mul this is my office uh, during last year's hockey playoffs. Um, I've got a NASCAR race on my iPad. I've got uh, Boston, Montreal on the TV, and I've got two other screens going at the same time. And I don't have cable. Right? This is coming off of the CBC online and et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a wonderful piece. Kleiner Perkin Caulfield um, does 164 slides. Um, I'm not the only one who does a lot of slides. Uh, they do a 20 minute, half hour talk at the Code Conference every year. You can find these online. And I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. Uh, even here's the link if you want to look at everything on kind of technological trends. Um, average minutes per day following the Olympics by device. The headline, media engagement rises with screen usage, two times higher for four screen users versus solo users during the Olympics. So we are in the multiple screen world. And demographically, and therefore financially, this is important stuff. And I think you know, if you wanna if you wanna look at why is television declining in numbers, to the extent that television defines itself as a single screen experience, um, it's gonna have a hard time. Um, also, just another slide. Um, to just twig you to think about communities of interest slash fans as opposed to audiences. When I used to be in the television business, there was this horrible phrase that I hated, eyeballs. It was, you know, we got a lot of eyeballs last night, which was this really sort of, you disembody a person, quite literally, and refer to the, the eyes as the only thing that's important to you. You know, and you wonder why television fails, right? Um, just even the language doesn't work. So then, kind of the next step in all of this is the easy one. Think about sports. You know, we've, these are all places we've gone already. Think about sports um, and how that's a communal experience and how do you replicate that communal experience through many screens, et cetera, et cetera. And, it's very easy to imagine, and sports has always had this wonderful association with technology. Uh, first television uh, event at the New York World's Fair was a baseball game. 
Um, there's a case called Canadian Admiral and Red Effusion where they were showing, I mean, the case was terribly important, way too important for a long time. It, it has no legal value to you today except historically, but the facts were, it's a federal court case, it was a, at the very beginnings of cable TV in Montreal, and what did they use? A live Montreal Alouettes game to demo cable TV. So there's always been this interesting association because there's so much uh, passion in sports and so much, I think, uh, audience money in sports. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll let you go through the slides in your own uh, in your own time, but you can, if you think about um, what the experience from a sports perspective can be over many screens um, and gamifying the experience, there's virtual arena stuff, there's sort of challenge stuff. I know the game way better than you do. Uh, let's bet. Let me show you why I'm right and you're wrong stuff. Uh, and then there's multiple screen stuff, like, uh, sorry to, you know, to only appeal to hockey players, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who would love to have a separate feed of the referee cam that I could just watch anytime I want. If you watch that on a hockey night in Canada, it's very cool. Um, so lots of interesting issues here. Um, spots or conflict issues, uh, but it ends up being sort of about multiple in inputs. And what happens when you merge singles, many screens onto one screen, or lots of information from different sources? So you're seeing tweets, you're seeing um, uh, curated content, you're seeing um, first party content. If you think of, let's say, a CBC Hockey Night in Canada game, you've got the CBC stuff, you've got tweeted stuff, you've got uh, other curated stuff coming from various places, and now you're merging it onto one screen in front of you. From a legal perspective, what are you, what are you doing? What standard are you applying? Do you treat it as multiple little screens? Do you look at it as one screen and apply the lowest common denominator legally to it? Do you make certain parties responsible for what other parties that they don't even know about are doing on that screen? What are you doing? We have no answers to this. None. This is happening, and we don't have answers. We will get answers. And again, think about your meme of technology influences your meme of law. Of course we don't have answers. It'll take time. It's a very unsexy answer, but hopefully it gives you some explanation as to why it'll take time. And there are important questions here because people are making elections. The best example is, uh, and there's lots of work done on this, is Google entitled to freedom of speech in the United States? Privileges. Is what Google does as a search engine speech? They argue it is. But they also don't want to give up the safe harbor benefits of, hey, we're just an ISP and we're just... We just pass stuff through. We're not responsible for that stuff. You know, we don't want to do copyright takedowns, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is changing. Right? We're starting to see the change. We're starting to see courts order Google to do certain things. The right to forget or the right to be forgotten. European court saying, you've got to take stuff down. So again, first comes the technology, then comes the navel gazing and the angst, and then come some decisions, and then those decisions evolve. So now we get into kind of we're all we're almost up to date. Things are moving so quickly. Um, 
gaming has always created this confusion, and, and culturally the best way of looking at it is, is films, where you know, you're inside the game. Like, you know, what's the matrix? Is it about the outside world? Is it about the inside world? You know, we create this confusion between the inside and the outside. And that's where games have been for a very long time. They are their own reality. That's why we love playing them. We get immersed in them. Um, and we get a little bit confused between the real world and the virtual world. But in this phase, not too much. Uh, there was an ill-fated EA game, but I think it was a very brave attempt called Majestic, which, um, you know, it was a computer game, but it would also phone you and fax you and do things in the real world outside your computer that were part of the game. Failed miserably, but it was a, it was a really neat attempt. And so the, the sort of phase one of this is this confusion. And now we get to phase two. And I, I call it direction reversal, where kind of phase one was we took the real world and we, uh, sorry, we took the real world and we put it into our computer screen. Sorry. Where we now get to is we take the computer screen and we start merging it with the real world. Except what, where I'm, and, and I, my guess is that it failed because it was ahead of its time. But I'll make this argument and then you be the judge. But now what we're doing is we're taking the screen and we're somehow merging it with the real world in a whole bunch of other ways. And, you know, the, the obvious example, again, from last year, is Ingress, which is a Google game based on Google Maps where you go, you're, you're, you're playing capture the flag, but you're playing it in the real world. And, you know, uh, augmented reality game gets player busted the first of many. You know, he, uh, he was playing ingress and uh, trespassed where he shouldn't be because he was playing the game and needed to capture a flag. And he got arrested, you know. So, these mergers become interesting. Um, oh, sorry, that. Uh, uh, but now add Ingress and Google Glass um, and Google Car and a whole bunch of things, and we start merging the world in very significant ways, potentially. And to go to your earlier point, where is the magic circle now? That's the core point. That's the core question. What do you do with that? Because the magic world has been, the magic circle has been what has fended off law, at least in theory. And we'll come back to the magic circle. And then don't forget Oculus. Now, this is a, a different thing. This is kind of fully immersive. Um, but as Andy will tell you, um, it merges reality and games in a, in, in a very different way. Oh, sorry. So, here's a quote, pretend you didn't see the previous slide. Uh, is this a video game? The process of creating a model of the world using multiple feedback loops and various parameters, e.g. in temperature, space, time, and in relation to others, very important, really I should put that in yellow, in order to accomplish a goal. Certainly sounds a lot like a game, it's actually consciousness. It's, it's Michio Kaku's definition of consciousness. This is a great book, well worth reading in this context. And it's very interesting to see how games and consciousness mirror, at least conceptually, which may be why it works. So here's where we are. You've seen this slide in talk number one. Oh, no. It's not poison, I suggest. It's poison. Yeah. You know, I will do, I promise, one slide for next week that has all the thought leaders because they're essentially saying the same thing. It is Boyd. 
and I'll put it up next to Boyden. Boyden followed me on Twitter the other day. <laughs> I was like, wow. Um, anyways, so where are we now? You saw this in, in talk number one. All of this gets enormously complex for lots of reasons uh, that, that we've talked about, virtual goods and uh, authorship, and uh, we'll, we'll get there. So now, what's next? Sort of arrived at the present. What's beyond the present? Now, you're going to say, okay, John's lost it. What is telepathic gaming? Uh, well, if John's lost it, John and Andy lost it, because it was Andy who essentially came up with the words, even. Oops. Um, and so you start with fully immersive. You add physical player response measurements. We'll talk about that. Well known that we already can control games with our minds. Uh, sort of neurogaming actually exists. It goes back. It's not great, but it goes back a few years. You add brain-to-brain uh, -brain interfaces. We'll get there in a minute. Big data, kind of constant real-time inputs. You can add 3D printing if you want. You can add remote vehicles if you want. You can add monetization and, and, and virtual currency if you want. And you don't know which way is up and which way is down, what's reality and what isn't. And you don't know who's controlling you and whether you're controlling yourself. This really does, this is why the game's consciousness quote is so interesting. Because you actually become merged with a reality. Is it your reality? Is it someone else? I mean, these are way too profound questions for, for the course. I, I call this brain games. This is where I've been doing a bunch of work since last year. And a bunch of thinking, as Andy Long has. So principle number one, there is no such thing as a one-way tube. If you're opening a tube outwards, and I know this all the way from television, like his basic rule of communications, if you're opening a tube one way, you're also opening it the other way. There are no one-way tubes. Controllers read you. We know that. And they're going to read you way more. So whether it's the Kinect, the Oculus, now you're, you're sticking something on your head. Is it going to, you know, can you voluntarily have it interface with your brain? Because it's certainly we have the technology to do that. Um, you know, the NSA can read your keystrokes. We know that as well. So we have all these devices. You know, this thing tells the world exactly where you are. So you take that and you add it to big data. And what, what? Okay. So those of you who are gamers, I will postulate that if I really was a terrific psychologist and had a ton of data on how you game and specifically on how you play Counter Strike. I know how you make decisions. I know your decision-making modes. And if I have all sorts of other data on you, um, you know, uh, uh, your heart rate, your, you know, what state of anxiety you're in, how much you've slept, you know, if I have a lot of other data on you, I know all your habits, I know an awful lot. And, and that's the thing about you know, games, you're disclosing a lot about yourself when you play. Because we all play differently. That's the point. It's Boyden. Our individual footprint, our individual self, our individual consciousness is mirrored in how we play. That's why this all hangs together. Um, MIT Tech Review had an article called Hacking the Soul, New technologies that look inside the mind and will make it possible to change what we think, feel, and remember. I'm going to go through this really quickly. Stanford has a video game controller that knows if you're bored. There are links attached to all of these. We're very close to having the first death in VR, in virtual reality. Andy will talk about this. But 
by heart attack is the suggestion. Neuroscientists plant false memories in brain. If someone secretly controlled what you say, would anyone notice? This is from Wired magazine. This isn't like extraterrestrials daily. And let me just go back. Did I miss anything? No. Oh, I did. When I think you move, researchers achieve brain-to-brain -brain interface. Uh, you really have to read this one, um, and uh, this just happened last month, but it's basically real telepathy, and it's not done through any kind of hocus-pocus. Um, and the basic technology that, that emerges, and this is, this is the, uh, the YouTube video you should watch uh, from Nature, the way this works, and I'm hugely oversimplifying, is that if I have access to your mind, I can map what you're actually seeing and how your brain reacts to it. And if I have enough of that data, when I see your, react, your brain reacting a certain way, I know what you're seeing. And it's you know, watch this. It's only four minutes and five seconds, but you'll see, and you'll see the accuracy with which what someone's actually seeing is reproduced through sheer technology and mapped. And this can actually go to your subconscious mind and, and your dreams. So researchers can see what you dream even if you've forgotten it. Dream recorders. Yeah. And then... You know, Valve is working on various aspects of this. And, and I think, I don't know how much Andy can say these. He probably is, is under a, um, an agreement, a non-disclosure agreement with Valve, but he probably knows some things about what they're working on. Any legal issues? So we will get to the legal issues in a couple of weeks because they really come around privacy. Um, but just to sort of tantalize you, <laughs> once it becomes possible to read people's minds, which it now is, and remember, he probably wrote this book a year ago, and make recordings, a host of other ethical and legal questions will arise. Well, those questions arise now. If you accept what I've said earlier, it's going to take some time to work it through the system. Great place to start. Ryan Kahlo, University of Washington, paper called Digital Market Manipulation. Where, and we'll, I'll talk about it a lot more, but how do you regulate this stuff? Where do you regulate it? Is consumer protection law enough? And this is where consumer protection law and privacy law are going to merge. And in my view, freedom of thought will become an important concept in law. A long forgotten concept. A concept that nobody's really done a lot of work on in about 100 years since Fury. Also, freedom of experience. Whoa. Which is different from freedom of thought. Because freedom right. of thought is just like being able to uh, like think what you want to think or whatever, right? But freedom of experience, like you should, like maybe you should have the right to not feel nauseous when you play my video games. Right. Or um, human bodies are incredibly fragile and the human mind is even more so. Um, if, you, if anyone wants a really easy primer on basically consumer psychology, there's this awesome website called You Are Not So Smart or Y-A-N-S-S dot com. Um, it is all about the science of self-delusion. And it is basically a catalog of how you can manipulate people, uh, I mean, this is not the intention of the website. If you had ill intent, you could use all the information on this website to manipulate people with a product into doing what you want without them realizing it. So if you're acting in a way that you don't know was caused by an external force and you want to do it, should you have the right to do that? Like... That's not that's not even freedom of thought, right? No, because you you think you're in control of your thoughts, but right. you're not. 
Well, and, and I, I, well, I, I would, I, I, my version of freedom of thought would encompass that. Okay, sure. And yeah. and, and include freedom of experience, but you're absolutely right. It's more. It's more than just am I have a right to think certain things. Am, mm -hmm. Do I have a right to experience certain things on my own terms, not just think about them? I, mm -hmm. I would encompass it together. But also, I'll take you back to Mavis Dixon uh, from Iogo, who came a couple of weeks ago and showed you how, how just current technology video games can manipulate you based on very, you know, simple psychological formulas without all of this direct brain interface stuff that we now have. Um, and all this goes back to Vance Packard and the hidden persuaders and how do you update it to the, to, to, to the current day and to digital technologies and what it's capable of. Um, bunch more articles, again, really, um, for those of you who are working on papers in the area, uh, sort of three pages of articles, and we don't know what's real, and which takes us back to Nick Bostrom of Oxford. Um, and, and this really is, <laughs> is interesting. Bostrom argues in this paper, which is well worth reading, that there's a really good chance, something like a 35, 40% chance, that we are simply living in the computer simulation of a future society. And he sort of extrapolates what computers can do and says, you know, it's really not far-fetched, you know, that in the future computers are so powerful that they can create an entire world or an entire universe and that we're just some, we're, we're inside the computer of some five-year-old kid, which is a future human. So not that, not human, but a future human. Now, there's, you can also have a debate on robotics and, and where that's going. And they're also working on these. They're actually trying to test it scientifically. There have been two, two uh, experiments. And the, the, uh, look, I'm hardly an expert in this, but as I understand it, the issue is actually one of resolution. If this isn't the real world, then we will see it pixelate at a certain point. And one study has seen it pixelate, and the other says there's no pixelation in this world. So the one that says we're pixelated suggests that we're in some future simulation. I think it's fascinating that it's, uh, it's mathematically unlikely, like if you just look at the odds, like of all of the universe's existence, it is mathematically unlikely that we are really here. It is way more likely that we're in a simulation. But the good news is that it doesn't really matter. Exactly. <laughs> you, still have to, you still have to write your papers. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what's the question? <laughs> yeah. Rosebud. Um, some of you will know that, some of you won't. So next week we start controlling. Um, in various forms, we, we have finished with connecting, and we are going to switch over, and Andy's going to have the rest of the time. People will okay. rejoin. Um, so I don't know that there's a huge introduction that's necessary here, but Andy um, is, uh, I, I would consider, a friend and certainly a colleague. Um, he has been embedded in the Center for Digital Media for a couple of years now, um, runs uh, a game company and has throughout, but uses a lot of student input and ex-students at the CDM for the master's program um, uh, definitely populate his company. He does lots of cool, innovative stuff, and um, uh, he has talked to this class before, uh, but this year I've sort of given him the big topic, which is the future, um, because he's been so good in the past. So there you go. Thanks, John. <laughs> yeah, John came to me and said, hey, how about you talk about the future? I'm like, can you be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, no, anything you want to talk about. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> so yeah, I'll talk about the future. Uh, so you have some, uh, oh, wait, that doesn't work. There we go. Hey, me. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, John covered most of it. Um, I founded a company called Radial Games uh, back in like 2008 or so. I've been a software developer since about 1999. And uh, yeah, uh, my passion is creating communities and uh, teaching and helping others make games. I'm not in this t so that I can, well, I want to keep making games forever. But uh, more importantly is I want everyone around me also making games and helping grow the local community and you know I run a lot of local game jams and community events and all sorts of stuff so I'm kind of involved in everything it seems like at times. Yes. Um, my last uh, three major titles which it's okay if you haven't heard of them because I'm an indie developer and I don't have a marketing budget so ah, that's all right. <clears throat> um, whoa geez this is really touchy. Uh, a few things I want to cover today, loosely, generally speaking, are just uh, general ethics, which I thought would be interesting for you folks in particular. Um, also, kind of the general future of the video game industry as I see it, and the differences and interesting points that come from augmented versus virtual reality, which are two very different things that are coming up. <sighs> but yes. Um, I'll preface, 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 I'll preface all of this from uh, a standpoint of I'm just the dude that makes games and likes people. I have no idea what legal terms are. I'm scared of lawyers. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's very uh, uh, low-fi in that regard, and uh, a lot of these topics may be, uh, you guys may be way over my head, I should say. In that sense. So uh, hopefully I won't be talking about things from too basic of a standpoint, but uh, feel free to like throw up your hands or interrupt or whatever. You say, yeah, yeah, and I'll move on. It's fine. All right. <clears throat> so first I'll start off with kind of uh, the foundation of all of this. Uh, the, the whole game, I have very few slides. It's very different from John. <laughs> you take it all in. This slide will probably be up here for like another five minutes. Um, there's a big change in the gaming ecosystem, video gaming ecosystem, going on for the last few years and will be continuing for the next few years as well. Uh, the primary thing driving this is the barrier to entry is just lowering, 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 lowering. It is, uh, it, there once was a time when I was writing software, I was competing with, you know, people with Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Comp Sci, you know, kind of uh, degrees. And... 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, but now there's people writing games and they're like 14 years old and they look better than my games and they play better than my games. And damn kids, you know, it is, uh, the barrier to entry is so low now that there is, oh, what is it? I think they recently hit 10,000 games per day added to the iPhone in last October, so that's a year ago. A day, right? So, if I'm a company trying to create games and trying to compete with like 10,000 games a day, which is ridiculous, it's a huge number, right? How, how do I stand out? How do I show up in the top rankings on the, on the iPhone store, on the uh, iTunes or App Store? How do I stand out and how do I uh, make a name for myself? And it's really, really hard and the whole industry is basically a grab claw game. It's like... You just pop in a quarter, and that's like your life savings. And then an arm comes down, and if you get a plushie, then you get to make another game. And if you don't, well, hopefully you're 14 years old, still living in your parents' basement. But if you have a rent uh, to pay, and you have to have a staff to pay, then you're out of business. So, uh, yeah, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary out there. But the good news for, say, potential future video game law people is there is infinite supply of customers that will be seeking your services. So, uh, yeah, there are going to be winners, but uh, it's hard to figure out how to become a winner. Um, it's kind of my job as uh, the leader of my company. My job is to gaze into my crystal ball every day, guess what next year is going to be like, and then act on it now. And then uh, looking at, uh, you guys know some cost fallacy? Some of you. Sunk cost fallacy, okay. Uh, sunk cost fallacy is uh, if you've invested a lot in something, you don't want to give it up, even if that is the most correct choice in your situation. 
So if you put $1,000 into repairing your car and then it breaks down again, you're more likely to sink another $1,000 into it because you've already spent $1,000. It doesn't matter that the next repair is going to cost even more. And then there's probably going to be another one after that, another one after that, when it would have been cheaper just to buy a new car. Right. So humans are bad at this, the sunk cost fallacy thing. So I have to look at games that I've been developing for two years, foresee the future of the industry, make a good guess, realize that that's not going to work, and then cancel the whole thing before it costs me the studio instead of just costing me time. Right? Might as well start again. So it, there's a lot of really hard calls to be made, and you especially have to make them because you're competing with... 1,000, 10,000 games a day sometimes. So that's uh, the iOS marketplace, like 10,000 games a day. Android is even more. Uh, then there's other marketplaces like Steam. I'm going to be talking about Valve a lot, I think, in this talk. So if anyone doesn't know, Steam is... Does anyone not know Steam? It's like my bread and butter, so it it's kind of blows my mind when, some, when someone has never heard of it before. So, all right. Um, Steam is a virtual uh, marketplace for selling video games on the internet. Yeah, self-publishing is a big thing. So changing ecosystem. It used to be, years ago, if you want to ship a game, you team up with a publisher. The publisher gives you a nice, happy legal team. They make you sign a 52-page contract. They give you money up front. You develop the game. And then they make almost all the money on the back end when it actually goes up for sale. So you're, it's almost like contract work, right? Almost. They're just buying creative. Then you make it, they slap their logo on the front. That's it. But now there's so many people making games that they can afford to publish you without giving you money. They'll just say, yeah, we'll slap our, we'll slap our logo on the front, and then we'll take all your money. And in return, how about screw off? <laughs> Like, we'll give you nothing. How about if we put the Sony logo on the front of your game, more people are going to buy it. That's, that's our marketing. Yeah, nice. And people buy into this. So Now, the first rebellion was, ironically, Valve itself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Valve, um, which made Counter-Strike, left Sierra, if memory or serves. Microsoft? No, I, I will, maybe. Okay. I, they left <laughs> someone numbers, because yes. they didn't feel the deal was was fair. Oh, yeah, from the publishing side. From the publishing yeah. side. And I, I do think it was Sierra. I, mm. I have this visual of, of Half-Life being on a Sierra box. And c kind of went their own way, did their own deal where they retained their IP. And that's actually been the genesis of, of the juggernaut. Then... You know, Steam logically arises from that so that they can treat other developers the way they wish to be treated. Mm -hmm. And they've now made endless amounts of money on that uh, marketplace concept. Valve has a gigantic money bin that they swim around in every day. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. But yeah, the, the founders of Valve were ex-Microsoft people as well. So they yes. came from the publishing environment and they started their own company. Then they kind of self-published a game, and it was super successful, and then they got to keep all the money, and then they just kept doubling down with that money. So self-publishing is like this really great thing, and it's not just video games. Self-publishing is becoming really big in books, and um, there's like Smashwords, I think, is a really popular one. If you want to write, write your own novel, there's ways to do that now, and you don't need to go to, you know, Random House or whatever. That's the only book publisher name I know off the top of my head. <laughs> um, Films as well, uh, that is way earlier stages. Just because the cost to make a high production film that actually competes with other films, that cost is lowering every year. So you can make amazing visual effects from a 14-year-old in your basement, right? Whereas before it needed a team of 100 with 1,000 hours of server time or something, right? So uh, film is earlier in the earlier stages, but there's a, game call, or a movie called Indie Game the Movie, which is a fantastic film, which is made by an independent film crew of two, and is a documentary basically about, not my life, but which I live vicariously through <laughs> the lens of the camera. Um, yeah, and that was completely self-published, and it was one of the first self-published films to like win a bunch of awards at Sundance, I think. Yeah. 
And it's showing in theaters like all across the country, or at least it was like a year or two ago. And at various times it's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been there, not been there. Hopefully it's there again. And it's the first movie that went for sale on Steam, which is crazy. So now the game marketplace, Steam, has uh, movies a bit available for sale on it. So self-publishing, what that means, uh, so before publishers would give you a legal team, they give you marketing, they give you um, money, which is nice. Uh, support, sometimes they give you technicians to you know, help bring your game to a console, for example. Um, they give you hardware to test your game on or to develop your game on. They gave uh, you milestones. Yeah, and they gave you deadlines. And if you didn't meet your deadlines and they stopped giving you money, and if you really don't meet your deadlines, they ask for all the hardware back. Hopefully you didn't sell it on the black market. <laughs> but uh, yeah, nowadays, self-publishing, you don't get any of that. You don't get a marketing budget. Like me, I don't have a marketing budget. You've probably never heard of any of my games because I have no marketing budget. Um, John's my legal team. <laughs> I probably talked to him for like an hour total on yep. legal issues. Um, keep it simple. Yeah, keep it really simple. But I, I'm missing out on a lot of opportunity doing that, but this is kind of the new reality. Um, I have a dev kit for the PlayStation 4. I have two dev kits for the Xbox One. Um, I have the Wii U dev kit. I have the Vita dev kit. I have all of the dev kits. I have all the contracts signed. I'm able to publish on any platform I want. And that's where our agreement ends. They just kind of throw a pile of hardware at you and say, now do what you want. And there's no support. There's no marketing. There's no money. There's no technicians. There's nothing. My one advantage in this industry now is that I have the dev kits and the 14-year-olds don't. Like, that's my only lead. And Xbox One is changing things. Again, um, the Xbox One doesn't actually require dev kits. When I say they sent me dev kits, I just mean they sent me a free Xbox One. Any kid that owns an Xbox One, that is a dev kit. You just sign up for the website. It's free. You sign a 10-page contract. Done. You can now publish games on Xbox. Like, that's, that's it. And you just upload a file. So there's still a bit of gatekeeping going on. This transition of just hitting a button and your game appears wherever you want it, it already exists on Android. I could make a game right now and you could have it, you could pay 99 cents for it later today on your phones, on an Android phone. It's a completely open marketplace that anyone can hit a button and launch a game, done. iOS makes you wait a week and they have some content filters. You can't make an Apple iPhone game. Um, that has excessive violence or pornography or whatever, right? And if you try submitting a game that has their banned things in it, um, they re respond back with this kind of boilerplate that says, if you want freedom of speech, please submit a book where we'll give you open access. But if you want to launch a game on our platform, you have to conform to our ideal views. And some of their views are you cannot criticize Apple. If you make a parody game that makes fun of Apple, they will reject your game. So it's like, that's an interesting legal, well, I don't even know. It's just like, stay away from that mess. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's crazy that um, you can just self-publish anything you want on Android right now. And, and, and this is enforced how? Through you their the contract and, with you. Yeah. They have a contract, and they have a team of people that will vet everything you submit to them. Right. Yeah. So now, sorry to go on the legal diversion, you're looking at freedom of expression, but in a contractual setting. So what are you going to do with those contractual provisions that effectively create censorship? If this was direct government censorship, you would know what to do with it. But what do you do with it in a contractual setting? What trumps what? And that's, uh, first of all, great observation. And that's where it resides. And that's where it moves to, I should say. But, that's, but, but it's not within the purview of antitrust or the Competition Act to look at freedom of expression. They're looking at whether the marketplace works and whether there are unfair barriers to entry. 
So now there's this duality where you're using the barriers to entry question to uh, sort of instinctively enforce freedom of expression as a democratic value. See, the stuff isn't fitting like perfect Lego blocks anymore. And, uh, but your observation is exactly right. I think uh, PR people from Apple have, not legal people, I'm sure this wasn't a court decision anywhere, but um, a PR person from Apple said, no, no, there's complete freedom in this marketplace because you can always publish an Android. Yeah. It doesn't, like, it doesn't matter legally that iPhones are outselling them in North America, right? It doesn't matter. Well, it, it matters to how the market gets defined, which is very much an antitrust competition law issue that we probably are not going to have time to get into in this course, but it, it collides. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, what you've described is right, but look at what you've done. You've jumped the shark from freedom of expression as a concept into something else to basically enforce what you feel or what we all feel is a freedom of expression, uh, freedom of speech right. It's interesting. Great paper in it, obviously. Uh, so before the Xbox One, and the Xbox 360, there is a program called XBLA, uh, Xbox Live Arcade, uh, which you could get your, say, indie small studio game published on the Xbox 360 platform. Um, for a lot of people, this was kind of the target. It's like, you've really made it if you get into this program. They only accepted 24 games a year. And... There's so many games being made every day that they heavily curated it. Uh, they heavily, heavily curated it. Like, they just slimmed it down to two releases a month. That's it. And if you had an amazing game, but they already had the two games that month, well, you could delay for maybe six months, maybe a year. Who knows? Or you could just not launch there, which is kind of terrifying. Um, but... The curation was there. With Xbox One, that curation has largely gone away. Uh, Microsoft still wants to maintain the image of their console. Like, they don't want you just playing, like, fart apps on Xbox One, right? Like, they don't want you doing that. So they still do curation. Um, Sony as well with PlayStation. Uh, they're also, like, they vet your software to see if they want it on their system. But... When it used to be, like two years ago, 24 games a year get on, now it's like there's 200 and the year's not even out, right? So they're really opening up the floodgates. Um, Steam system, um, they used to be a pure curation system. You'd have to essentially pitch your game to Valve, and then they would let you on to the Steam marketplace. A few years ago, they introduced Steam Greenlight, which allows you to kind of make a page and you kind of pitch your game on this page and people can vote on it. And if you get enough votes, then you automatically get into Steam. And they started letting in 10 games per month. Uh, and now they're up to, what is it, 800 games this year so far? And it is going away. They're removing Greenlight. Pretty soon they're going to allow you to just self-publish and they won't even curate anymore. The marketplace is now so big that there's no point in them curating it to make sure that the marketplace stays pristine, right? They can't possibly handle that, and they don't want to hire a million people just to curate games all day. So they're automating the whole thing. Um, a big step towards that was they changed the marketplace so that the front page used to be a curated selection of 10 games that they picked. Now the front page is based on your interests and your likes and all these other things. So if you don't like fart games, they won't show up on your front page, so it solves the problem. They Facebooked it. Yeah, they, yeah, they just used their big data to, to figure out the system, like they solved the system. All the problems... Um, I, get, I get racing games. I mean, yeah, obviously. You get racing games, yeah, yeah. Whatever game you like will now show up on your front page. That's it. So curation is no longer a problem there, so there's no reason for them to restrict entry to anyone. The more games, the better the system works. So they're going to open that up. But again, right now, I'm really happy on Steam because I'm one of a few people that successfully pitched to Valve and I get some royal treatments and they put me up on featured images and stuff like that and I get money for that and that's awesome. I love that and it keeps my company afloat. But starting in the next few months, we're going to start seeing, I don't know how many, maybe 10,000 games a day in a few years again. Right? It's going to be the same problem in a new marketplace. And this is always the case in every market, is this discoverability problem. 
and it becomes really, really difficult to deal with. But uh, in this changing ecosystem, now anyone can publish pretty much. There's a guy that just had his game like two days ago launched on Steam. And the launch didn't go as planned. It showed up, he got a big banner image, and on the bottom of the banner it said, now available on Greenlight. But it wasn't, it was now available for realsies on the store. This is on, uh, th this is on News of the Week right now. You can, you can find it, there but you you'll go. tell the rest of the story. So Guy gets upset that it was mislabeled on his big banner. And he goes to Twitter and he says, I'm going to fucking kill Gabe Newell, the CEO of Steam. They're Valve. And Valve's response was, we have ceased all communication with this developer and pulled all of his products from our store. We will not comment on this further. He has not only sunk himself, his name, his avatar on Twitter, like is now forever linked to this action. And he's resigned. Doesn't matter. I know. He no, he, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's resigned. You can again yeah, find this on News of the Week. This just happened like late last night. Yeah. He resigned. He made a sort of fall on a sword switch speech that he yeah. he's going to have nothing to do with the company. He's not going to make any money, and he hopes that Steam and Valve will take the game back because of the team. Yeah. So it wasn't just him alone, right? There's the whole team working on the game, and they all got flushed down the toilet with this guy because he couldn't contain his temper on Twitter. So that kind of brings me to this uh, next slide. Whoa, next slide with this thing. Whoa, oh no. Oh geez. Hey, PowerPoint screwed it up. It says uh, uh, yeah, social accountability. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, it's yeah. just scrolled off the top of the screen. Social accountability. Uh, so social accountability is something that we have to now deal with in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, what you say on Twitter uh, like you're talking about the EU, um, was it legislation where they said the right to forget stuff? Yeah, the right to forget. Yeah. I mean, this dude that launched his game on Steam really badly wants the right to forget <laughs> on his name, on his team, on his game, on everything. Right? He really wants Gabe Newell to forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. He really <laughs> wants Gabe Newell to forget. He really wants, like, he hit the delete button on that tweet really hard. But it doesn't matter because someone screenshotted it, and it's, it's there forever, even though it's not online anymore. Right? Your decisions will forever haunt you with our current setup. I've made some tweets when I was like, uh, when Twitter first opened, however old I was then. I don't, I don't know. I made some unsavory tweets that I hope no one ever looks up, and I don't, have, I, I don't even care. It's like I'm not going to go back and delete them. <laughs> They're probably archived somewhere anyway. Um, there's people saying um, when they're applying for jobs, the companies are asking for their Facebook passwords as part of the application process. This is how serious they are getting about vetting people. And that's probably illegal. I don't know. <laughs> but people are doing this, right? This is how important um, your social presence is. And this is really, really important because, because there's no publishers. There's no marketing budget. There's nothing helping you. So all I have to do the marketing is me, and all I have is my social presence, and that's it. And it's so easy to spoil that now, and it's so easy to ruin that. Um, Gamergate? Anyone know Gamergate? Anyone not know Gamergate? I'm, like, living through the hell that is Gamergate right now, so it's... Uh, Gamergate is... Uh, Bullshit. <laughs> it's about journalistic ethics. Seriously. It's basically a bunch of internet trolls saying that there should be better journalism in video games, and to support this cause, let's destroy every woman in the industry. How about? Yeah. It gets more complicated than that. You can look it up if you want to. There's an awesome article this morning on ClickHole, which is uh, the Onion site, the Onion's uh, sister oh, okay. site. So it's like this parody news article about Gamergate, and it really does like the perfect job of describing it. So you can check that out, clickhole.com. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of people now that are kind of jumping on board this kind of thing. And if you have the Gamergate hashtag in your Twitter search history, you are way less likely to get hired by anyone in the industry now. Unless you're like making a sarcastic remark or something. <laughs> but it is like it is like a death tag for this industry. And fans of games, they 
don't see the problem with it. And it's really easy through the you are not so smart stuff, uh, through uh, uh, the, the weakness of the human mind. Um, a lot of people don't see what the problems are. Or they fall for it, just like um, uh, conspiracy theories. You can't argue with someone that has a conspiracy theory because engaging them in the conspiracy theory reinforces their neural pathways and they can't distance themselves from it, right? There's, there's no way to defeat someone, especially when their theory says, if you have logic, then I'm right. So you can't logic them by definition, right? That's why it's a conspiracy theory. Anyway, so social accountability is like this really interesting thing, and it, Gamergate is an interesting catalyst for all of that because now we have um, a whole bunch of high-profile journalistic websites that are covering this whole issue, and this Gamergate thing is going to be with us for years, and it's going to define the cultural atmosphere of video games for the years to come. Uh, there may be legislation around this stuff. Um, some of these Gamergate folks are... Um, calling in mass murder... Um, Death threats. Well, yeah, they're saying if someone comes to your school and speaks on this, we're going to murder everyone in the classroom, right? Well, I'm going to bring in my assault rifle and, you know, right? This is, like, their arguments they're using, right? So now people are actually canceling talks like what I'm giving right now. I'm allowed to give this talk because I'm a guy. And I'm white. So it's great. I'm safe, right? But if I was a woman right now, I would not be t saying any of this. I'd be scared out of my mind. Right. So FBI is getting involved. There's all sorts of NSA uh, stuff happening now that they're getting involved. They're trying to track down all the anonymous people that are making these threats. But if nothing happens, people will remain in fear of retribution, and it becomes basically terror, right? You're terrorists. So uh, we're working on the industry, law enforcement, the legal system is working on correcting this problem, but it's like a thing in progress right now. And we may have legislation in the future. Because if you have the right to forget, how do I find out the guy that made a death threat on me to report it to the police? Right? So should we have a right to forget? Well, the right yeah. to forget has parameters to exactly, it. Exactly, but... right? Right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Um, but speaking of journalistic... Did you take... Oh, no, there it is. Um, speaking of journalistic integrity, though, which is what Gamergate is supposed to be all about, journalistic integrity... It says journalistic up there. This is, like, from the launch of, like, Halo 4. This is why we can't have ethics in journalism. This is why we... It's really hard to have ethics in video games because it's almost impossible. Most of the video game writers I know, most of the journalists I know make less than minimum wage. And they need to do shit like this to go home with any money at all. I bought a guy a beer once, and he has given me front page coverage ever since. Gamergate. Right? It's impossible to have ethics when no one is willing to pay the journalists for the service they're providing. And video games are way too small of an industry for you to make a profit you know, charging 10 bucks a month to access Kotaku or something like that, right? Which is a gaming website, right? So it, it's almost impossible to make money in the industry, and you have to have Mountain Dew and Doritos sponsorships just to get by. And it's really, really hard to exist right now as a journalist. It's really hard to have ethics. In You've got ethics. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. So, um, whoa, <laughs> all my titles are missing. Uh, that says cultural responsibility. So we're kind of coming up on these cultural responsibility issues where, uh, uh, um, have you guys seen the Hatred trailer, the movie, or the, there's a video game called Hatred. It just opened up a trailer. The trailer opens up with a guy that's loading up his assault rifle saying, I'm sick of all people. I'm going to go out and murder a bunch of innocents. And then the trailer proceeds to just shove pistols into people's mouths and blow their brains.